Hi, I'm Michael Burke, and this is Money Talks. Hi, welcome to Money Talks. Today's show is going to be quite different than usual. I'm going to be sharing with you the recent trip to Europe I took with CNH Industrial and uh, courtesy of CNH and the Journal Times and some of the slides. It's the first show in three and a half years that I actually don't have a guest, just my pictures and my words. But first, I'd like to thank our sponsor, Total Furniture, your friends in the furniture business, where you save 20 to 50 percent off name brands. Open four to save you more at 8400 75th Street in Kenosha, open Friday through Monday. Please. On July 20th, I flew into Paris and uh, to join a contingent of about nine other journalists. And um, this was one of the sites that uh, I was able to see less than two blocks from my hotel, the Arc de Triomphe absolutely famous and stunning monument in the midst of a great big traffic circle. The first night we joined our host CNH Industrial and CNH Industrial has some common ownership with Fiat and so we went to the France Motor Village and this was kind of interesting it's where Fiat has a showroom and um, some souvenirs and it kind of shows off some of its brands. It doesn't sell from here it just basically shows some of the brands and some of the, um, there were Jeep. And uh, this was actually a spiral shape little showroom. And so you walked up and you saw cars on successive levels. And the way they got the cars up there was the center platform would actually pancake and then they would drive a car onto it and then it would lift into position. After that, we had an absolutely fabulous French meal. This was our first real destination and this is called, I'm going to butcher the pronunciation here, but it was the Chablis Domaine Vaucare et Fille. And what that means is the Vaucare was the last name of the, um, the vintner and he and his sons. And this was in Chablis, France. Chablis, because of the particular kind of soil, lends itself well to making Cabernet and all they make there is Cabernet and almost all of it is sold on the east coast of it, uh, the in the US almost all is sold in the uh, eastern part of the country. We learned about the different regions uh, for winemaking and again it's all about the soils and what the soils lend themselves to and here was one of our guides explaining the different regions. This was a look at where they were actually making the wines. We had a tour through here. These are really huge oaken barrels, but there was also another room where the barrels were smaller. And the reason for the smaller ones is that there was more surface contact with the oak. And in particular areas such as Japan, they said there's more of an affinity for a more oaky wine. And so uh, they were, would do them there. This is um, an actual snail fossil. This was about the size of, um, oh, I guess, a small watermelon, you would say. And this was a snail. All you could see in the soil was clay and limestone, and, uh, but, but that works for the grapes. We had a wine tasting that day after our little tour, and we ended up in a really beautiful old part of the, of the winery. And this is one a stained glass window obviously in the tasting room. This is the tasting room. I wasn't able to get an answer to how old this building is, but it was clearly hundreds and hundreds of years old at the, at the very least. Here we are up in the vineyard itself and this is a New Holland grape self-propelled grape harvester. It's kind of a funny looking tractor, but it works. And these are the structures that just gently, they, they straddle two rows of grapes in the vineyard and these just sort of gently shake the grapes and the grapes fall into that white area in the bottom and they actually fall and are carried backward into a hopper and um, they're so gently handled that they're not broken and that's really important. 
in making the wine. And here's one more look at the tractor with the, the beautiful valley and the town of Chablis in the background. And this is that soil I was talking about. You don't see any black soil in it. It's all limestone and clay. And there's a uh, cultivator also moving through the, the field. And one more shot of our little group from the cab. That day, earlier that day, we took a break before we actually got to the vineyard and we ate at this restaurant. I took a picture of the name so I remember it. We had an absolute gourmet meal. And this restaurant was beautiful. And with that, if you can tell in this picture, there's a, a small stream actually flows underneath the restaurant. The restaurant's built over the stream and we were sitting right in there and ser served um, some really great French food. This is Ulm, Germany. We had moved on by now and this was the next day and um, we're here to learn all about a company called McGuiris and this is a CNH industrial brand. They make the world's tallest ladders, we're told, fire truck ladders, and um, what they do is they don't build the chassis, but they build fire trucks on top of, of, of chassis, and basically they're almost always custom made, um, sometimes in more mass quantities, but usually just built one at a time, according to the specs of the, uh, the customer, of the buyer. Uh, they also make, we learned about the company, and they also make a really pretty interesting um, variation on the ladder and that is an articulating arm that has a platform it's actually made for obese people who would be caught in a fire um, on a high story and the um, the platform would bash its way through the window it's big enough that you could put an obese person on it withdraw them from the from the um, the burning building um, they also make low profile fire trucks for um, for many of the bridges in Europe where they sell. This is our during our factory tour, a look at some of the ladders on the factory floor. This is me. I'm just checking out the, the controls during a break in the action. And the funny thing here, the controls actually have a picture of a rabbit and a picture of a tortoise. Um, so you can pick the speed that you want based on that. This is one of their airport fire truck specialty vehicles. This has one hose on top and one on the front, almost like a machine gun on top and, and the front. And these are made so, they're made to go fast and um, they're made so sturdily that they're actually made to bash through um, fencing on airports and just rush to the scene of a plane that's crashed. Um, we spent that afternoon um, doing some, we're now at the training facility for McGuiris and um, one of the things we got to do was we got to operate the controls of this articulating ladder and what this uh, young woman is doing is you had to go up and over a barrier and then down you had two, two joysticks, one on the left, one on the right, pick up a, a softball from off a cone and then move back to your left and place it on the cone and then move back to the starting position. It was pretty challenging. This is their fire, uh, their tallest ladder in the world. It's 68 meters when fully extended. They didn't have it fully extended that day. They had it at 53 meters, which is, uh, I calculated, roughly 18 stories. Um, another activity uh, just mentioned, I don't have a photo of it, but we also got to play around with an actual fire hose and try to knock tennis balls off of traffic cones. Uh, I didn't think I was going to go up on this thing because I hate heights, uh, but I found somebody else who was also kind of chicken and had not done it. She works for McGarris, and she and I, when I found out that you don't have to look down at the ground, you can actually look out above the horizon, I uh, decided to go along, and we did go up to the top. This is our uh, last hotel. This is now, we are in Turin, Italy, and um, this was a, a very beautiful, beautiful hotel. Um, whose name is escaping me at the moment, but I'll hope hope to uh, think of it as we go along here um, and uh, it was five stories it was in the uh, the city center and our first visit while we were in Turin was to um, that morning was to what's called the CNH Industrial Style Center and on the way in we had to hand over our smartphones and they they put a piece of opaque tape over the camera function on our phone we had to agree not to take any photos while we were in there and even the hired photographer they had was only allowed to take certain pictures and we got a um, this is basically a really fascinating briefing on on how designers think about um, future tractors and uh, in fact CNH industrial 
is in the course of kind of revising the look of some of its of some of its tractors under the New Holland and Case IH brands. And this was a demonstration where a designer as, that you see in the foreground on the left was sitting in the back of the room with a stylus and a computer and he was sketching and we were watching this happen on the screen in front of us and in about the span of about 12 minutes he had drawn just this kind of uh, this image of a Case IH tractor. Uh, this is pretty, pretty fun, this is pretty impressive. Um, Later that morning, we were in the CNH Industrial Village, which is where you see um, one of these big, sorry about that, one of these big tractors. I think I just went ahead um, farther than I wanted to. Um, part of that was a um, kind of a, a gallery of, of older vehicles. These are some old um, Fiat Army vehicles. Um, that afternoon we moved to, uh, it's called an energy independent farm, it's outside of Turin and uh, Case New Holland, or I'm sorry, New Holland has a second generation prototype of a tractor that runs on methane and what this farm, it's called the La Bolada farm, does is they, they grow maize, or we call it corn, for silage and once a month they load their digesters, there are two of them like the one you see on the left, and then they also I think it's every two weeks. They also load some free manure from a farm down the road and um, produce methane and then the methane can be compressed and used in the tractor. It can also be used and is used on this farm to make electricity which they sell back to um, the Italian utility or government, I'm not sure which. And this is in fact that, that one prototype tractor um, these are still some years out, but they could be a way for farmers to not have to buy diesel, but to actually grow and, uh, and kind of cook their own fuel. This was the Wednesday night we were gone, and this was, I would say, probably the high point of the whole experience. And we are now at the Palace of Venaria outside of Turin. And this place has, we, we got a private tour before a gourmet meal, but this place has all kinds of stories but it was used by the, the House of Savoy, the ruling Italian family at one time. And as, as huge as this is, it was actually, of all things, a hunting lodge for the aristocracy and um, basically it was just a place for them to play. And um, that's our group going in, one end of it. And it had just sumptuous grounds um, Napoleon's army had actually come in at one time and taken this over and uh, ripped out all the art, actually ripped up marble tiles and um, used it as their barracks. Um, since about 2000 there's been an effort to restore it and put back some of the, not some of the original art, but some of the art that looks like the art that was there and it's, it's, a, it's a really nice restoration job. This was a prince who thought highly enough of himself to have a painting made with an angel floating above him and, and he's wearing a wig. This was a pretty amazing piece of furniture with inlaid, I guess it's ivory. And this hall was absolutely spectacular. They called it the Grand Hall or something to that effect. Um, you could stand at one end of the hall and just speak in conversational tones and hear the voices echo about um, a thousand times down the, uh, down the hall. Um, this was an art project to uh, sort of recreate the look of a stairway inside the Palace of Venaria. This was a chapel and the, the, the boys who would go out hunting would actually ride their horses into the chapel in the morning and get blessed for a successful hunt and ride out of the chapel and go hunting. Um, this looks to be a dome. It's actually flat and was painted to look like a dome shape in that top and it does indeed look like a dome. These were the stables. They had something like, I don't know how many horses, but they had something like 130 servants just to serve this hunting lodge. That's me on the roof. Uh, this is one of the dishes. We had several journalists who have food blogs and they kept taking pictures of everything they ate and this was the one time that I decided to take a picture of one of the things they served us that night and uh, it was some delicious green bean dish. That's all I can tell you. This is looking out of my hotel room. That's me. Beautiful views. Now here we are the last full day and we are at uh, the World Expo in Milan, Italy called uh, Expo Milano 2015. 
and this is the New Holland Pavilion. That's inside the New Holland Pavilion. And some New Holland equipment inside the pavilion. And this is a tractor that was actually parked on a grass roof of the pavilion. This is the USA Expo and the vertical farm that the U.S. had built for its, its expo. Uh, we had dinner the last, that last evening we had dinner up on the roof of this, of the USA Expo. And this just kind of gives you an idea of the fantastic architecture at the expo. This was the UK exhibit and devoted to the health of bees and uh, kind of supposed to uh, evoke the idea of a beehive. This was part of the Italian part of the village. Um, the Central Street had um, um, basically coverings to keep the sun off of you for the most part. Um, this, this, this is not real seafood, but if you walk past it, you would do a double take because it looked like a display of seafood on ice. This, I believe, was Peru. Uh, we saw a lot of living. Um, the theme of the, of the expo this year was uh, feeding the planet and uh, clean energy. So there was a lot of greenery in the themes. This is Chile's exhibit. And we end with the Tree of Life. Um, that's what this was called, and they had those fun um, things to sit in. And the next day, I flew back from Malpensa Airport in Milan.